Um, during uh, Carrie's talk, she referred to the Stormwater Pollution Prevention Plan many times, and uh, you get that it's basically the permit for your site. Um, the general permit is worded in just that fashion. It's extremely general, and it covers all construction sites, whether they're an acre of disturbed soil or 160 acres of disturbed soil. So you can imagine what that has to encompass. So you have to get specific for your site, and that's what the Stormwater Pollution Prevention Plan does. As Carrie stated, it's, what you're, it's how you're telling us how you're going to comply with the permit. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. We'll talk about some issues that uh, we see, um, who needs to sign, um, when they do need to be submitted. You know, things have kind of loosened up there a little bit, and that's a good thing. Um, there for a little while, if you submitted it, it had to be reviewed. And uh, that was kind of a legal requirement on our end, but uh, that's kind of been loosened up because of the, the volume that we're seeing there, limitation and staff and stuff. So uh, that was some good news. Um, what needs to be in them and uh, how often that they need to be updated. The requirements are listed in part four. So basically, I can just sit down because I don't have much volume. But um, if you want to review those things, that would, be, that would be good. If you have insomnia, you need to get to sleep at night. I'm not saying that Karen don't know how to write, but um, you know, regulations tend to be a little dry. Um, but all the requirements are there. It's fairly straightforward. Um, I do know, and uh, a gentleman running a business in southwestern Oklahoma, he is illiterate but a uh, very good businessman. And uh, his daughter was in the eighth grade and she was able to read and digest the uh, requirements for a stormwater pollution prevention plan and put one together for him. So you don't have to be a PhD or an engineer in order to do one of these plans. You do have to be an engineer to do engineering design work to stamp it and stuff like that because that's the law. But um, you know, for the most part, you can do these designs on your own if you wish to do that. Um, as long as somebody has a, a comprehension and the understanding, they can do it. Uh, but they must be prepared prior to submission of your notice of intent. Um, sometimes when we get caught in a situation where somebody hasn't applied for permit coverage and um, they get in a bind whenever we show up on site, and they don't have permit coverage, they don't have an SWP3, and we're trying to jump through a whole bunch of hoops at once. Um, but, uh, you know, that's something that, in the, the way that things should run, it should be done prior to submission of the NOI. They need to be prepared in accordance with good engineering practices. Like I said before, the license P is only required for those parts that involve practice of engineering, like design of a sediment basin. Now, there is a provision in there that you can design your own sediment basin without the help of a PE, but it's going to be usually much bigger than it needs to be. A PE can do the design for you based on um, the uh, USGS uh, depth duration frequency tables and things like that, um, but there is one that's uh, 3,600 cubic feet per acre drain that you can build yourself without the uh, aid of a uh, professional engineer. Like I said, that's going to be uh, pretty well a, a much larger basin maybe than you, you might need. Um, as Carrie also pointed out, you need to address requirement for support activities, uh, whether it's a concrete batch facility or an asphalt batch facility. Um, you're going to meet the requirements of the OKR05 as well. As she pointed out, there may, there's going to be some sampling. There's going to be a, uh, uh, an annual comprehensive site. Uh, evaluation that you have to do and submit um, and those things are covered in the permit as well. Um, you do need to include information on endangered species uh, if they are in proximity to your site and we have a number of them in the state. Um, it's uh, my mind's a little muddled this morning from the medicine that I took but uh, I do believe that those species are, uh, you can find that information on our website, if not in the permit itself. Um, for sites discharging to receiving waters that are impaired by sediment, you need to document how your best management practices are going to address those issues. Because uh, 
sediment. As, as far as sediment is concerned, I think it's just a handful of streams that we have in the state where it's in, impacted by sediment situation. Now, TSS is something different. Uh, that's a different beast, but uh, sediment is going to be something that's a little bit more difficult for us to get a handle on because of the sampling requirements for uh, sediment, which is uh, generally moving at the bottom of the water column. Um, for sites discharging to um, a TMDL water or a watershed plan, you need to document how your SWP3 is going to be consistent with that. Um, we do have some of those around, so be aware of where you're at in the state. There's a lot of information on that flex viewer that we have on our site now. Um, I keep trying to remind myself that I'm going to ask my boss if he could make it where I could use that flex data viewer on my computer at work because they kind of keep me locked out of some things that I don't need to get into because I have a tendency to, to mess stuff up. Um, you need to keep the uh, SWP3 on your site and it needs to be available uh, if we come out to do an inspection. Um, if there's a sign out there posted with a phone number where we can call and uh, you can get that SWP3 to us fairly quickly, you know, within a few hours, you know, that's fine. But um, it, you need to have your uh, permit number on there, copy of the notice of intent, um, the name and phone number of the contact person, uh, brief description of the project, those sorts of things. Now, as far as the signatory requirements, this is something that, um, you know, I kind of winked at for a long time. Uh, EPA kind of harps on it. It's a, a finable uh, thing that if, if you're deficient in this, you don't have it signed by a corporate officer or something like that, um, it's going to carry a penalty with the Environmental Protection Agency. But it is pretty important to have it signed. And you say, well, why? Why does it need to be signed? Well, if the president of your company signs the uh, stormwater pollution prevention plan, it carries his weight and authority. And employees, contractors, can be fired for not abiding by that. So that's why it's important to have it signed by a corporate officer, um, president of the company, a chief financial officer, somebody that has a power of life and death over these individuals. So, you know, if it's signed then, they know that this person approved that and that they must abide by it. So it's pretty important to have these things signed. Both the NOIs, the NOTs all have to be signed by those, um, those folks. Any reports generated, uh, any information requested by DEQ, any of that stuff has to be signed by an appropriate official or a duly authorized representative. Um, generally, you have to have a letter or something like that that makes that person authorized by the company. Um, as I said, it's got to be done in writing. Um, it can be a named individual, it can be a uh, office of an individual. Um, the certification statement that basically says that you swear full faith and fealty to Hedy Lamar and the evil and incompetence for which he stands is 6.74. That's uh, the certification that you're signing and that's something that I always say because that's one of Wayne's favorite quotes. And you forgot to get up here and tell everybody that uh, what I say doesn't necessarily is not necessarily represent the views of the Department of Environmental Quality or the Station Management. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I may say some unprofessional things, especially since I'm slightly medicated. So, um, <laughs> Mickey, you're going to have to forgive me if I say your favorite quote. Now, Mickey says no, don't say it because she knows exactly what I'm talking about. <clears throat> this is that uh, particular certification, and it doesn't say anything about Hedy Lamar. But uh, it does have quite a bit to say, and you really are signing something that carries the weight of the law. Um, if, uh, if you've ever sat down with any of our attorneys, you know, they, they kind of run through an explanation of what you've signed whenever you certify that uh, you're going to be abiding by this stuff, that you've read and you've understood the permit. Um, it's pretty important that you, that you read and understand what it is that uh, you're signing here. And... Um, the, the thing about it is that last little statement there, submitting false information, possibility of fine imprisonment for knowing violations. You guys are running honest businesses. Don't do anything criminal. There's not any reason to. So you forget an inspection. Don't worry about that. 
you may get in a little bit of trouble, but that's nothing compared to falsifying stuff. Don't do that sort of thing. It's not worth it. Don't worry. Don't, don't sweat the details. You know, don't sweat the small stuff. Let's keep the sediment on the site. That's really what we're looking for here. So when you sign this thing, you're certifying that you are not going to do those things. Now, this kind of goes back to the days when we reviewed every single solitary SWP3 submitted, and we had some that were submitted that didn't need to be, and then it kind of hung up the process. But nowadays, we just send them back to you if it, you don't need to send them in, and that's, uh, like I say, that's a good thing. But uh, if you're located in an outstanding resource water, you might as well go ahead and submit that thing. If your site is located in an ARC, you might as well submit it. You're going to have to anyway. If you're disturbing more than 40 acres of ground at any given time, you might as well go ahead and send it in because you're going to need to. And that will expedite the process for you. Um, I suppose, you know, if there's any question, you can go ahead and send it in. Now they're going to be going, no, no, Matt's going to be going, no, don't, because then we got to send it back to them. But, uh, you know, it'll, it'll expedite things if you'll go ahead and send it in if you know you have to. This is where you're going to send this stuff. Um, and all this information is contained uh, on the back of the NOI form. On that next page, it has the information of where you are to send this information. So um, I'm not going to leave it up there much longer. Identify a stormwater team. You know, it helps when you've got people that are trained and know what they're looking for, that know what best management practices are supposed to accomplish. Um, if they don't understand, if they don't understand how things are to be installed, um, how much does it cost to have silt fence installed? Anybody know off the top of their head? Two dollars a foot. How long are some of the highway projects we've got going? Eight miles long? You know, you think about if, uh, if it's two dollars a foot and we got eight miles. How long, Wayne? <laughs> Say that again. Eighty thousand. Eighty thousand bucks or eighty thousand feet. $160,000? You know, you think about, it, is it installed correctly? Don't pay them before you go out there and inspect it. When I, when I show up to do an inspection, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to grab a hold of the silt fence and I'm going to be pulling on it and tugging on it. You'll see me doing that. If I can slide it out of the ground or slide it out from under whatever is on top of it, it's not installed right. And don't pay somebody that kind of money if they haven't installed it right in the first place. So be aware of these things. Have people on your team that are trained to identify whether these things are done correctly or not. It'll save you a lot of money in the long run. Um, they're responsible for the SWP3 and for compliance with it. Um, identify these people by name or position. That's fine, as long as you know who's doing it. Um, include individual responsibilities, what they are responsible for at the site. They need to have access to the permit, they need to have access to the SWP3 and other documentation, and they need to have a little bit of authority. That last deal is just uh, keeping a copy of the OKR-10 with you in the SWP3. It's required. It's one of the easy requirements to me, just make a copy of it. You're going to have a description of the construction activity that you're doing at the shot. Uh, the size of the property, total area disturbed, all these nice things. Like I say, this makes it specific for your site. What surface waters you're close to, um, the schedule of your activities, that gets to be pretty important. Um, the dates you're going to shoot for to have stabilization there. Your site map just needs to be legible. A hand-drawn one is fine. It doesn't have to be CAD-drawn or anything like that. Who, who all are my uh, engineers in here today that are doing consulting for people? Oh, okay, so I've got some, so I can talk bad about y'all with y'all here. That's good. Um, <laughs> you know, as far as the guys who are doing these design activities, um, it's good that they provide you with a good starting point. But remember, this thing doesn't it just need to sit on a shelf. And I know that they may charge you dearly for that uh, uh, SWP3. But it needs to be something that you're going to be changing. Um, the, I think the quote is, it's a, maybe it's a marine quote, that it's a, it's a bad plan that can't change. You've got to be able to change 
when you're on the ground and you're out there doing this stuff. And um, I told the guys that I was talking to yesterday, think of this as a battle. It's not a battle with people, it's a battle with the elements. And uh, you're trying to your best, you're giving to your best faith effort to uh, keep the sediment on your side. And um, so if you think of it that way, it is a bad plan that can't change. You've got to be able to change it to meet the requirements to keep that sediment on your site to the, to the greatest extent that you can. Um, topography is going to be a huge deal. How hilly is your site? One of the things that I tell people is it's a state law that there's a creek or a stream running through every project or near every salvage yard or near every uh, construction site. It's not necessarily a state law passed by the legislators, but it's a state law based on the topography of our state. Uh, we're just a hilly state, rolling hills. And, uh, you know, that's just something that you have to deal with. It's going to drain off fairly quickly. Um, you're going to have a list of any allowable non-stormwater discharges that you may have at the site, location of any uh, activities that are going to generate pollution, sampling locations. Do you have any paints? Do you have any solvents? Do you have fuel at the site? Location of the fuel is a pretty important deal. You can talk to a company that we got after just a short time after I went to work for DEQ because of the location of the fuel, uh, uh, the fuel tank. And it was a rather large fuel tank and unfortunately they either had vandalism or somebody ran over it with the tread of a vehicle. It's quite possible they had vandalism. Fuel was expensive at the time. But um, you know, think about what's going to happen if you have a fuel spill. How quickly is it going to make it to the water? Uh, do you have a berm around the fuel tank? Um, you know, those SBCC requirements uh, have gotten a lot more stringent, and that's also going to be part of your stormwater pollution prevention plan. Um, I've already talked about this to a certain extent. <coughs> The controls that you're going to use to reduce the amount of pollution that's running off of your site, you're going to have a description for that in the plan. Mickey, I've got to use the quote. Oh, man, she's waving me off. If you don't plan to do this, you're not going to do it. That's usually what I say afterwards anyway, Mickey, and I guess that's more of a professional way of saying it. But, um, man, I want to say it so bad. Everybody loves that quote. Okay. She's still saying no. No, no, I'll say it at the end. I got to do it? Well, you know that I say that all the time, every time I do this. Admiral Josh Painter. Admiral Josh Painter in, I'm going to say it, Mickey, in Hunt for the Red October. Remember when the, the spy land, you know, wound up on the, uh, on the aircraft carrier, and he said, what's his plan? And he said, well, I don't know what his plan is. And he said, a Russian don't take a dump, son, without a plan. Well... <laughs> That's kind of how stormwater pollution prevention is. <laughs> You're not going to do it without making a plan to do so. It's just not going to happen. And um, the, the better your plan is, the easier it is to change the things that you need to, you know, you've given consideration to what it is that you're trying to do. So keep that in mind. And uh, I think it's kind of a fun little quote. I know it's entirely unprofessional, but um, it's something that you'll always remember, hopefully. There's a lot of resources out there for best management practices now. Um, there's uh, menus online. Um, you can get that here, the menu of BMPs on uh, epa.gov. Um, and there are other sources as well, not just EPA. But um, remember that we don't do bail barriers anymore. I have seen a couple of them. The only two that I ever saw work properly were on DOT sites, Mickey. They were installed correctly and they actually held back water like they were supposed to. Most of the time they don't get installed right um, and that was another reason why they were taken out of the toolbox. So um, I think probably Carrie's right. You'll, you'll be better off by covering your ground back up, maybe busting those hay bales up, scattering them around and uh, pinching that in somehow. Um, 
Your best management practices minimum requirements are to design to retain sediment on the site. That's the ultimate goal. You don't want it to run down, go to Lake Eufaula, go to Lake Texoma, that's my fishing hole, so, and it's been filled in with sediment on the north end. So, you know, think about where this stuff is going. Uh, your public that you're serving is thinking a lot more about where it's going than they used to. And so they're going to be, uh, they're going to be more watchful than they used to be. Um, I use the acronym AIM. Uh, there, where you see there, it's properly selected, installed, and maintained. Um, they need to be in the right application. Then they need to be installed properly. And then you need to maintain them. Usually maintenance is the number one problem at any given site because a lot of times you'll see a silt fence that was installed and then you go out there and you look at it and you say, where's the silt fence? It looks just like a little chicken wire fence running out through there at the time. And it's not the silt fence, it's the wire that was the wire backing for the silt fence. But that's all that's left. You say, where's your silt fence? Well, we installed it at the first of the job. And that's an answer that I've gotten. I installed it at the first of the job. And then they never maintained it. So, you know, maintenance is something that uh, you're going to have to do. If this stuff is working, it's going to stop sediment, it's going to fill up. And then you need to get in there and get it ready to go again. It's doing you a good job, you just need to maintain it. You need to remove any offsite accumulations of sediment to minimize impact. What are you going to do if you fill up somebody's creek? You're going to get out in that creek and you're going to clean it out? How are you going to do that? It's not going to happen, is what I'm telling you. Because you'll tear the pea waddling out of the creek. You'll just tear it up trying to get in there and, and remedy a situation that if you can keep it from happening in the first place, you're a lot better off. Uh, any fines and penalties that you might face if we have to show up and do enforcement with you are minimal compared to what's going to happen if you get dragged into court by somebody. So be aware of that that uh, you can be uh, taken to court under the Clean Water Act and it's a lot more punitive. Court's a lot more punitive than we are. Um, we can get after you and you know, it'll be kind of like your dad catching you coming in from a late night somewhere, you know, and you've had a little bit too much and then you get in a lot of trouble with dad. Well, what's gonna happen if the cops catch you out there? You know, it's gonna be a lot worse. You don't wanna get dragged into court. Remove sediment from sediment traps or ponds. You know, if I'm walking across a site and I can't tell that there's a sediment trap there and I step off into it and I go up to my neck, you know, it quit keeping as much sediment as it was sending out when it reached about 50% capacity. That's why they want you to clean it out when it reaches 50% of the capacity. So consider those things. Stabilization is probably your best friend. It's probably the, the most important aspect of pollution control for stormwater. Um, in your SWP3, you're gonna describe vegetative or non-vegetative stabilization practices. Uh, it may be temporary, it may be final. Uh, temporary is gonna be your annuals and things like that. Uh, annuals don't do near as good a job as perennials do for uh, keeping the, the sediment from getting started in the first place. And we can talk about the, uh, uh, the process, you know, of uh, sediment getting started through erosion and then getting transported and then finally getting uh, deposited somewhere, usually in a lake or a stream. But um, think of stabilization as uh, the fight and the battle in the, in the very first, in the beginning, or, or starting to play the football game in the first quarter. Is OU or OSU going to win or lose if they wait? You know, you always hear us say, we started playing ball too late. Well, that's what will happen to you if you're doing stormwater pollution prevention and you start playing ball too late. Stabilization is huge. Leaving mature vegetation in place before you need to uh, disturb it is huge. It's going to help you a lot. Structural practices are things you're going to do later on. After the soil has been broken apart, lifted by the stormwater and started to carry off your site, then you're going to have a sedimentation basin. You're going to have something downstream there, maybe a silt fence or something like that. And you say, well, I, boy, I wouldn't compare a silt fence to a sedimentation basin. Well, all silt fence is is a dam. It's a big plastic dam. It's not much of a dam, but uh, it's better than nothing. 
and installed right, it'll hold back a lot. But think of it as a big trash bag stapled up to some posts because that's what it is. And uh, it can only handle so much. About a third of an acre is the rule of thumb. So be aware of that. We'll talk about these uh, types of things a little bit more this afternoon. Um, the uh, two bullets there in the middle, that tells you what's required to have engineers help you with their two-year, 24-hour storm. That's from the depth duration frequency tables by USGS. Or you can provide 3,600 cubic feet per acre drain on your own, and you can design that yourself without the uh, aid of an uh, engineer. Velocity dissipation is another pretty big deal. A lot of times you'll see rock that has been covered up by uh, sediment because of the way that it slows it down. As the water has to move and splash across those rocks, it's going to drop the sediment out there because it doesn't have the energy necessary to continue to carry it. You need to have your SPCC plan either appended or part of your stormwater pollution prevention plan. Talk about spill prevention and response in your SWP3. It's best to have some stuff written down. And when, once you get this stuff done, a lot of times you can just carry this from job to job. But uh, remember to be site specific on locations and things like that. But uh, the type of response that you're going to provide to a spill, once you've trained your employees on how to do that, they're going to be prepared to do it. Now, the first time, you know, might be a little bit tough, but uh, once you get used to these sorts of things and thinking about them, you'll be able to stay on top of them better. Uh, waste management is another big deal, you know, having uh, trash containers, uh, think about sanitary waste, where you're going to locate your um, sanitary facilities on a, on a construction site. Um, probably right on the edge of a slope is not the best place to locate your uh, sanitation facilities. Um, we never have wind in Oklahoma, at least not wind enough to blow over a porta potty do we now we that happens doesn't it well think about those sorts of things when you're locating these <clears throat> any monitoring that you're required to do uh, this really is more specific for con uh, the concrete batch facilities or asphalt batch facilities that you might have people are going to need to be a little bit more trained about how to take a sample what to look for um, how to preserve it where to send it and things like that um, We've just made those OKR05, the industrial general permit requirements uh, across the board, basically, by including them in the uh, construction uh, permit now. I kind of harped on maintenance. I, I harp on maintenance if I ever do an inspection of your site. Um, that's something that is uh, just terribly important because it's so easy to get going. Once you, once you get started with the project, um, once you get going on a project, uh, your business is not pollution prevention. Your business is building roads. Your business is building houses. That's what you do for a living. But sediment control or stormwater pollution prevention is something that you do as part of that now. So it's something to remember. And uh, I know that it's hard to remember, especially when you get to going. But um, staying on top of it is pretty important. And uh, it can keep you from, like I say, discharging a bunch of sediment that goes and impacts somebody's pond or somebody's stream or something on their property that's off your site. And at that point in time, you're no longer in control of that sediment. It's been taken away. Um, so uh, deal with it through maintenance. Um, one thing there, and um, the term practicable is not a word. I don't know what... Uh, you know, bureaucratic nonsense came up with the term practicable, but the word is practical. And I, I've kind of gotten to where I don't like the word practicable anymore. But it means practical, if it's impractical. And we understand that whenever it's rained several inches over the last five or six days, that you can't get in there and maintain your BMPs. We understand that. We understand you can't send a vehicle down in there to clean and stuff out, or even probably personnel, by virtue of the fact that it's just too boggy. Well, as soon as it's practical, that's when you're going to get in there and do your maintenance activities. 
And what you do is you write those things down. You keep notes. Remember that if you ever get called in to DEQ, you're going to live or die by paper. Because we're not out at your site doing our meeting. We don't get to see what happened six months ago at your site. But it's your notes. It's the information that you provide for us. And you've got all that stuff written down. You bring in a stack of papers like that, and you say, what do you want to know? Because I've got your information right here. Then we start looking at stuff and say, well, okay. We can understand where you were at at that point in time. So keep good notes about the practicality of your situation. You want to do this as soon as possible after the events that impact your best management practices. And you know um, how they look. You know whether they're working or not. Take a lot of pictures. It doesn't hurt at all. Take a lot of pictures of your site before you get started. That's a, that's a huge deal. Take pictures of uh, areas around your site. If you have access to streams or ponds or anything like that that are around your site, take pictures of all those places. That way you'll know what was there before, and you'll know what was there after you get done. Identifying qualified personnel is a, is a pretty interesting provision there. Um, if you've got somebody that's doing work temporarily for you, are they going to be a good inspector for you? Probably not, unless they've been trained in this stuff. And they can exhibit uh, some confidence and some knowledge of what these things are supposed to do. You're supposed to provide, at a minimum, every 14 days, an inspection every 14 days or within 24 hours, and within 24 hours of a half inch or more. We've kind of changed that. It's no longer or, it's and. Now you can do it more frequently than that if you wish. Well, what you specify in your SWP3, do that. Follow your SWP3. Include an inspection form with it. Um, I'm gonna harp on this just a second. I'm gonna touch on something that is uh, important. Uh, I'm gonna go back to that uh, statement that I made about doing criminal things, don't do criminal things. Doing an inspection of a site, I got to looking through the inspection reports and there were a whole bunch of blanks and there were a whole bunch of signatures. Don't do that. Don't do stuff that in advance, okay? Don't do stuff so that you can cover. Don't do that. Just Fill one out when it's time to go do it. It's not going to be that hard. Don't do criminal things. It's, there's no reason to do those sorts of things. Take just a, another minute of your time. Do it just like this. <coughs> that certification statement down there is what comes back to bite you in the rear if you start doing criminal stuff. There's just not any reason to do it. Um... You want people who understand what the permit requirements are and what the best management practices are supposed to accomplish, the proper installation of those best management practices, when one's filled up to 50% capacity and things like that. They need to have an understanding of this stuff. We've got an uh, example of EPA's SWP3 template. You can create your own. Uh, but keep a training log for when you've done training. This is very easily done at a tailgate uh, um, meeting or whatever you might have, maybe a, a safety meeting once a week or something like that. Talk about keeping things picked up at the site. Maybe talk about uh, if you've got certain areas marked that are the edge of disturbance, you know. Maybe talk to your, your uh, earthwork contractor and say, remember not to get out beyond those flags. Used to, I used to think that uh, that was bull crap. You know, somebody said, well, you know, I can't control my uh, bulldozer operator. He got out there and was just getting after it, and he bulldozed down all those trees, and I didn't want him to. And I told him not to go out there and do it, but he did it anyway. And I was going, ah, bull. But now that I've driven a bulldozer, and i got to tell you, it's a lot of fun, you know, and you're out there. If you remember, if you played with Tonka stuff at all, I mean, you know, so talk to the bulldozer operator.
Because he may be out there having fun. They say, man, whatever you do, don't get beyond. I've got it marked out there with those flags and stuff. Don't get beyond that. Tell him not to. Okay? It doesn't hurt. He may look at you like, I'm not stupid. Okay, but I know once you get on that, you're going to be like a six-year-old on a Tonka having fun. Because that's how it was for me. I'm just telling you. Um, anytime that you make corrective actions at the site, keep a note of that. Put that down in a log of some sort. Um, repairs, modifications, uh, anytime that you have to get in there and beef up controls. You know, one of the things that Amber said is if you're going to get out there and disturb a whole lot of ground, you're going to have to have stronger controls. That's just the way it is. So anytime that you have to uh, replace or beef up controls because they're not significant enough, not strong enough to handle what it is they're facing, make notes of that. I love to see an SWP3 that's got a whole bunch of colored pencil or colored pen or whatever it is that you choose, however it is you choose. Highlighters, there's a whole bunch of different colors of highlighters. You say, I didn't know we were going back to first grade and start coloring again. But it makes it real easy once you start color coding stuff. And I love to see pencil marks and marks all over an SWP3. If you've got a map on the wall of your construction trailer and you've got all this stuff marked up there, initials, dates, things like that, <clears throat> excuse me, that's good. That's good to see. Anytime you do cleanup disposal of materials, you need to have that information. <clears throat> this kind of information can remedy permit violations if we find those types of issues. So remember that. You live or die by paper. Your notes and stuff are going to help you out a lot. We've talked about non-stormwater discharges a little bit. Um, that stuff is listed in there. But um, you need to identify any time that they're combined with stormwater discharges. The pollution prevention measures that you use to, uh, to keep pollution out of those areas. Um, and you want to make sure that you use measures or that you implement measures to reduce or eliminate those types of discharges. If you got a fire or something at the site, you know, there's going to be a lot of stuff in that uh, fire water that is kind of rough because they're putting out a fire. The first thing is that they want to make sure personnel safety and they want to get the fire put out. Okay, one of the second things is that they don't want to let that water run off into a stream or something. And like I say, there's a list of allowable non-stormwater discharges there. Just kind of go through that list and, and give it some consideration. Is this going to happen out there at my site? The uh, contractor certification stuff, that's up to you whether you want to use that type of thing or not. Um, it's something where uh, don't just have it be another paper that they sign either. This would be something that would be good for you to talk about them with. Say, we've got a stormwater pollution prevention plan here, and we expect you to, to abide by it. And the things that you're going to be doing are, and you're going to have them listed out there because you know what you're paying him for. And so he needs to abide by this SWP3. Say, when you're out there, watch out for these things. A lot of times, you know, in the past, I've gone done inspections, and a subcontractor will come in and just plow right through the middle of sod and silt fences and I don't know what else and just tear the crap out of it you know they didn't abide by the SWP3 well why did they have them sign the contract certification and didn't even talk to them about it they said well you know you can't control subcontractors yeah you can bust his chops I know you can't force him to do this stuff but my goodness I don't know I'd probably chew somebody's rear if they tore up stuff like I've seen torn up that cost somebody quite a bit of money to have it installed. And it was installed properly, and it got torn up. Any subcontractors in here while I'm talking bad about them? <laughs> They're not going to hold their hand up now, are they? Well, anyway, you know, you know who, who you are. If you've done it in the past, don't do it anymore, you know. They're not required, but... You know, it's not a bad idea to have those sorts of things. And you have a chance to talk to those contractors about your SWP-3. We do have uh, those available in the permit. 
The one there on the left is the EPA version, I think. The one on the right is ours. And I've talked about this, making changes to the document. Um, man, change it up. And write all over that thing. It's great. I love to see lots of pencil marks, dates, initials, things like that, where changes have been made to an SWP3. What construction site have you ever been on that hasn't changed from start to finish? What construction site have you ever been on that hasn't required actual engineering changes on some of the stuff that you're constructing, you're building? Change has to happen on a construction site. You meet unexpected obstacles that you have to get across, and uh, the SWP3 is going to be no different. EPA provides some templates and examples of SWP3s. Like I say, you don't have to go to an engineer to get these types of things. They are available. Their expertise is there. They've uh, built several of them. So, you know, it might be that you want to go to an engineer or somebody that puts these things together professionally because they've already got it ready to go. They can get you one in a hurry. And, uh, you know, they can make it site specific for you. You can do them yourself. It's kind of up to you how you want to approach that. Um, webcasts are, have been recorded. And you can take training online if you want to. That's on EPA's website as well. Are these going to be available? The, okay, so you don't have to worry about copying all this stuff down, but be aware that it is in the presentation. You can get that information later if you need it. I'm afraid I might have gone way over. Y'all got to be hungry. But do you have any questions? I don't know if this is a question for you, Joe, or maybe back to Amber if she's still here. She's here. Um, real quick, uh, the buffer zone requirements, uh, the 404 uh, permit, uh, is if that the buffer zones aren't required if your activity is authorized by a 404 permit. How does that need to be reflected in the stormwater pollution prevention plan? Um, you're going to have uh, you're going to have narrative in there that's going to describe that. Uh, as well as probably on the maps, I'm assuming. Have you seen that sort of thing, Amber, in any of your SWP3s you've reviewed? Yes, but I would just address it, John, say what you just said, and we're in there. Um, Amber, come here. <laughs> Mickey wants you on mic, so. I do Sorry, just what you just said, write it in your stormwater pollution prevention plan in the narrative. This is covered by a 404 buffer zones not addressed. Because you know you're going to have that section in your SWIP that's going to be specific to those endangered species requirements. Address just, it there. We just got to figure out how to, which is but different people do in different parts of it, and we just got to figure out how to make it work that you guys, that we meet your expectations. So we'll have to talk. As long as it's just clearly stated. Thank you. Anybody else? <coughs> This is kind of in response to Don. What we've done is we've list the buffers and then you know the requirements, and then we put a statement that it's exempt because it's a water crossing, or it meets it's under a 404 permit. And that's how we've addressed it in our SWIPs, and Karen's approved those. Anybody else? They're hungry. Yeah, they're hungry. That's a good thing, being right before lunch. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>